Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a tattoo to share with you or to show. Um, I have some scars, but you probably don't want to see those. So uh, that's enough about me. Um, I want to start by telling you a story about water. Um, it's actually not about water. This, this story is about the inherent optimism of today's design thinking. There are parts of the world, mostly developed countries, such as the Gimbela region of Ethiopia and others, where people get their daily water from a river uh, nearby. Uh, the river is usually polluted. Um, and this is what they use for their daily drinking and bathing and whatnot. Um, and obviously, um, polluted water is a problem. So what many well-meaning government agencies and private companies want to do is install water treatment facilities in these areas so that people have a constant, fresh, free source of clean water. The only problem is that they're having a hard time getting people to use them. Now, wh why would someone you know, make a conscious decision to get polluted water rather than get it from a free facility? Well, for one thing, in order to use a facility, um, people are required to use the five gallon government issued container, which isn't a problem in and of itself until you consider how many people in developing nations tend to carry large objects. And if you kind of think about this, you realize they carry large objects on their heads. I'm not, I, I can't speak for anyone on, on this, uh, in this conference. I know that I'm not strong enough to lift five gallons of water and put it on my head and walk any distance. Um, so that's, that's, that right away is a design flaw. But there's another um, aspect that's, I think, a little more subtle. And that is that as soon as the river was removed from the equation, um, they removed an essential component of what made these people who and what they are as a community. You see, everything happens at the river. This is where they congregate. This is where they worship. This is where they educate their children and settle disputes. And by removing that, that component of their lifestyle, um, in some ways, they destroy the very fabric of their society and their way of life. Um, this is an example that I didn't come up with on my own. Uh, I found it in a, a really, really interesting paper in, that appeared in the Stanford Innovation Review written by Tim Brown and Jocelyn Wyatt. And they mentioned this example as well as others. And they say, you know, time and again, these otherwise well-meaning initiatives will fail because they're not based on the needs and the behaviors of the people who actually have to use them. Now, it, we live in interesting times, which is probably goes without saying, but you know, we, we live in these times when almost every day we have some new technological thing happening from, um, I, I mean, remember five years ago, the iPad came out or six years ago, and then it went into wearables, and now we're talking about AI and machine learning. And yet there are still some areas where some of these fundamental questions don't get answered and fundamental problems don't get solved. As a way of example, the year I was born, Victor Papanek wrote um, what I think is the seminal book on this topic, and I would think it's been mentioned today already at some point, but if it hasn't, I will mention it. Um, it's a book called Design for the Real World. It still holds up. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and to me, everything that we're talking about today pretty much begins and ends inside these pages. Um, and Mr. Papanek is also responsible for this um, sort of mildly complex mind map diagram where he tried to depict pictorially the the kind of the dichotomy between what people really need and how we get them to that point. And I'm not going to read every single bubble here, thankfully, but I do want to point out two items in which he, he uh, kind of calls out that what people really need is participation and making goals for themselves. And the way false goals are achieved is when we do a very small part of what needs doing in order to keep things the way that they are. That's, that's, a, that's part of the dichotomy as, as, as he saw it. Now, how do we solve this problem? I'll go into that in just a few moments, but first I wanna tell you another example of inherent optimism and design thinking. And this one is close to me because I actually work in this space. Um, and it's also, also close to home because it actually takes part here in the United States where I live. Um, there are, just like there are people who don't have access to fresh water, there are also people here in this very country who don't have access to fresh, affordable food and they call these food deserts in the United States. And time and again, people who live in primarily urban areas, but it can be rural as well, um, they tend to rely on corner bodegas and small shops for, for their food items. And these places tend to be um, overstocked with um, junk food and other kinds of um, you know, non-nourishing items. And so again, and this is not a critique, this is well-meaning people look at this and think, you know, 
we really need to have a grocery store in this neighborhood. That would solve all the problems. And so they have uh, you know, a, a somewhat awkward groundbreaking ceremony. People come by in suits and, and, they, and they put a shovel in the ground and everybody comes by and says, look, there used to be a food desert in Gary, Indiana or in Eureka, California or Camden, New Jersey or anywhere else. And now the problem is solved. And there's tremendous celebration because 46,000 square feet of non-perishable stock has now entered into the community. And everything is fantastic. Until two years later, for any number of reasons, the store is unable to maintain its profit margin and it goes out of business. And now the problem is worse than ever because not only have they lost a food source, they've also lost a source of employment. And yet, someone has managed to overcome these obstacles. A man by the name of Jeff Brown, who heads an organization called Uplift Solutions, has opened a number of ShopRite supermarkets in the New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia corridor in areas that used to be known as food deserts. And these stores are thriving, and they're bright, and they're beautiful, and they do fantastic, and, and they're almost ensconced in the community. Now, what has Mr. Brown figured out that other people haven't? If you were to uh, do a Google search for things like social innovation, you see there's a number of frameworks and books and articles out there, and they all kind of center around this same idea that in order to achieve productive, positive change, we need some combination of vision, skills, incentive, resources, and an action plan, and that's how we move forward. And if any of these things are missing, um, you know, things tend to go asunder. If we don't have vision, then people get confused. If we don't have skills, then people get anxious. Um, if we don't have incentive, then we have delays. If we don't have resources, people get frustrated. And if we don't have a proper action plan, we have many false starts. And just so you know, I've done every single one of these mistakes at some point. I am, you know, I'm just by way of disclaimer. However, you know, I, one thing I have thought about is, you know, as, as good as something like this can be in terms of a, a strategic model, it doesn't solve the, the, the fundamental problem of like, how do we bind good design to good results? And I thought about this for a long time. I, this is the kind of thing I, I think about and I, and I struggle with this question. And in the summer of 2014, I found the answer and I found it in a very unlikely place. About five years ago, a Kansas City advertising agency called Victor and Spoils um, was charged with developing a campaign to get people to eat more broccoli. And I was fascinated by this. I, I read about this in the New York Times Magazine. Um, and I reached out to the person behind the campaign. His name is Andy Nathan. And he knew somebody who knew someone who knew me. So, you know, kind of play the networking game. And he agreed to talk to me for about, you know, one or two hours. Really smart guy, really brilliant. And he said a lot of smart things. And, but the one thing that stuck out at me more than anything else was when he said, you know, Kel, it's not about getting people to eat broccoli. It's about changing behavior. And the only way you can change a behavior, I mean, there's, there's one thing you absolutely have to do. You have to create an enemy. And I started thinking, all right, who or what could be the enemy of broccoli? Well, according to me, of broccoli was deemed to be kale. Broccoli's hipster doofus cousin. Uh, you know, if, if you really want to be healthy, you eat broccoli. That's the real stuff. Kale was for posers. So we can agree or disagree on that, but it worked very well. So I began to think, what is the enemy of inherent optimism? What is the enemy of, of poorly thought out design thinking? I'm not sure what it, I'm not sure what you call it, but I think I know what it looks like. So here we have um, a staircase in Minsk in a photo taken by my friend Deb Gilman. And if we look at this, there's about 26 or so steps here. And you'd think that's a lot of steps for somebody who's elderly or for someone who's blind or in a wheelchair or a father or mother with a, a kid in a stroller or anything like that. So someone, again, very well-intentioned, thought we need to maybe do something about this, provide a ramp or some alternative means of going up and down this, this, these flights. And so what they did was create a very long, steep slope, which is very dangerous to go down and next to impossible to go up. Um, I'm not sure what you call this, but this is the enemy, this, this idea of the things we're talking about here is this nice to have, this bolt on, this something that happens after the thought. So what we need here is some means of perhaps thinking about this in advance, and which is why I will introduce to you, as per the title of this discussion, 
um, seven ways that we can achieve sustainable impact. I'm not saying they go in order. I'm not saying you use them all. I'm not saying you have to use any of them in any particular instance. Um, these are just examples that I've seen um, in my investigation and I'd like to share them with you and uh, we'll see where we go. They are as follows. Problem recognition, personal empowerment, uh, solution framing and reframing, persistence, upcycling, storytelling, and understanding. And I will explain all these esoteric terms. No one will be left out. We will start with recognition, um, which to me is really about acknowledging that there are social models of exclusion that take place. Um, I certainly have seen it in my work in the disability sector. Um, it's often unspoken, but it is there. And it's something that you know, we have to acknowledge and recognize is a part of the, the design construct. Um, I am, I've been doing some work with the Renaissance Project in the New Orleans, um, who really impressed me. Um, uh, even 10 plus years after her, the effects of Hurricane Katrina, um, more than half of working age African Americans, uh, uh, American males in New Orleans remain out of work. And so what the Renaissance Project does is try to um, build cultural and economic programs largely centered around the Lower Ninth Ward in terms of kind of elevating, elevating this, this, this consciousness. And, and I bring them up because um, I've gotten to know Greta Gladney very well, who is the executive director of the Renaissance Project. And what she has said is that, you know, people tend to live in a scarcity mindset. And for them, it's just a given that there are those who will go without. And that's the way it's always been. And that's the way it's always, always will be. And I'm not saying it's our responsibility as designers to change that necessarily. However, I think it is our responsibility to understand why and how that can happen. Because once we do that, we can look at achieving empowerment, which in my mind is, is really about celebrating the self. Um, I think about someone like Ron Finley, pictured here, who is known as the Gorilla Gardener of, of Los Angeles. Um, what he does is he takes empty uh, parking lots, abandoned parking lots in um, South Central LA and turns them into gardens so that he can distribute vegetables throughout his neighborhood. I think about 15-year-old Trisha Prabhu, who developed an app called Rethink, um, which helps to educate and protect young people when they go online from cyber bullies. And when you, you know, this is a very wise quote by, by Trisha when she says, I, I already knew how to code, I know it's something I'm passionate about, and I know that I can make a difference. And in, by empowering herself, she ends up empowering other folks. We should, while we're talking about technology, we're pr probably kind of think about what the role of technology really is in this space. It, it, the, the way I look at it is it's about expanding the continuum of human capability by framing and reframing a problem in different ways. For example, I think about Liam McCarthy who got a 3D printer so that he could develop um, a, a prosthetic hand for his son. You know, what compels someone to do this? What compels Alejandro Shea to um, create a, a foot-powered wheelchair for his young, young son who has a spinal injury so he can control the wheelchair on his own. I think about the words of Dana Florence, who is a mother of three children with cerebral palsy. Um, she is the executive director of a nonprofit that supports parents um, with kids with disabilities. And what, what she has said, and I've heard her say this, is that you know the most frustrating thing for me as a parent um, is waiting for something that I know I'll never get to use because it's hidden in some university laboratory someplace or, or you know, any number of logistical or financial or other reasons why um, something that could transform my child's life is just not available to me. So what they do is they try to find the solution themselves or build it themselves. You know? And there's a very terse meaning here. Um, you know, this idea of, of persistence, this idea of constantly looking at problems and tr trying to pr translate them into a what-if scenario. Um, for example, Gabriel Diamante, who developed an open source still that, that uh, transformed salt water into fresh water through some kind of composite in the ceramic housing. I think about Dr. David Walmer, um, who has uh, developed his own coposcope, um, which is made out of essentially a, a pair of binoculars, a, a bike lamp, and a green filter. Um, and it, it sounds you know, kind of basic, but what he's done with this really intriguing instrument is reduce the, uh, the incidence of cervical cancer in Haiti um, by, uh, by almost double digit percentages. I take great inspiration um, by things happening in developing countries. For example, an all female technology collective in Nairobi called Akira Chicks. Um, they created a very simple SMS texting app that 
improves price transparency among farmers, um, thus helping distribution of crops to the villages in Kenya who need them and reducing market corruption. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I, is probably been discussed already today, and I think that we all would agree to this, is seeking inspiration from things that surround us and upcycling solutions in, in, in different kinds of ways. I think that's really what being sustainable is about. It's, it's not having to discard a solution that maybe didn't work for one thing, but could work for another. Uh, an example I've always liked is this by the uh, My Shelter Foundation. Um, there are many homes in the slums of the Philippines who do not have electricity, and so they sit in the dark in the middle of the day. And what this group does is it takes um, plastic bot discarded plastic bottles, fills them with chlorinated water, and puts them in the roofs of the homes, which creates natural light. And they've done this in 10,000 homes at, at, in Manila alone. Now, when we get into telling these stories, um, it, it's one thing to say what the problem was and what we did for it, but it's another to think about what success looks like and how we know if something is working. How do we emphasize the results of a, of a solution? Consider the example of Architecture for Humanity, um, who builds schools in Africa, very, very well-designed schools. And if you were to ask the Executive Director of Architecture for, for Humanity, um, Cameron Sinclair, he would tell you that um, he's not funded based upon the school's design. He's funded based upon the number of jobs that the school will ultimately create in that community. So he has a very you know, specific marker of success that he uses. Which brings me to the last component, which is understanding. Now, I, I have here designing for empathy and accountability, and I think these have to go together. Empathy is one of these words that I think is, to be honest, I think is getting used quite a bit in, in, in the design space, perhaps used too often. Um, to me, empathy has to be bound to accountability in order to create that sense of understanding, that sense of, yes, I get it. I understand all the social, cultural, and economic factors of a problem and, and my ability to be able to you know, create transformational impact because I really do understand it well. And I think the only way to really achieve that is to immerse ourselves into an environment. Um, if you're interested in developing an agriculture pro program for kids in urban areas, you know what, go to a school in an urban area and talk to them and get an idea of what would, what would translate well. If you're one of the many people who want to disrupt healthcare um, through use of an app or a device, um, I, one thing I would probably do is spend time in a clinic with the front desk nurses um, because these people are superheroes and they are the ones who really keep the health ecosystem moving and it involves a lot of phone work and a lot of paper. If you have been charged with developing a mobile app for people who can't see, Turn off the screen on your phone and uh, rely on voiceover or talk back and get an idea of what it's like for them. Um, millions of people do this. It's, it's perfectly possible and in fact they excel at it. If you're interested in creating a sustainable source of, of light for homes with no electricity, sometimes uh, it, it's valuable to turn off the lights in your house and try to get along for a few days and see what that's like. I really think this is how we graduate from the area of nice to have to something that is essential for human survival. And I think this translates no matter, no matter what kind of technological solution or design construct we're starting with. And I know that we're living in a time when um, the discussion now is about artificial intelligence and machine learning and when are robots going to take over uh, <laughs> you know, our jobs and all that. But you know, the, the, we will never lose that human component. We will never lose the importance of hearing someone tell a story and be able to say to them, Yes, I get it. And in case you're wondering, yes, this is the binary code for the words, I get it. I looked it up. So, um, and, this, and, and, and every technological advancement over the past 500 years has, has followed the same format, whether we're talking about um, the first prosthetic hand or movable type or the post-it note, anything in the past or whatever technology ultimately becomes. Um, as I said before, it's all about extending human capability by meeting fundamental human needs. Now, um, I have a few minutes left, I think, um, and um, I, I, I have been told, or, or at least I've read, or somehow I know this, that people only tend to remember three things from any presentation. Um, so I thought um, I would give you three takeaways as the conclusion of, of, of this little talk here. Um, and I'm gonna give them to you in the form of quotes by my late grandfather who himself was a designer and an architect and a humanitarian. And 
and frankly, a little bit of a curmudgeon. Um, and I've always kind of taken these with me, and, and I think they translate well to our theme of sustainable UX here today. So these are three quotes by Kel's grandfather. Get ready. Uh, no, the first one is, if it was a snake, it would bite you. This is what he would say to me when he asked me to go in the garage and get something, and I couldn't find it, even though it was right in front of my face. Chances are, um, there is something obvious that we're missing. Um, and it probably has to do with understanding the behaviors and the attitudes of the people that we want to serve. Um, it makes perfect sense that no one could put a five gallon jug of water in their head and, and, and walk some distance. Um, but it's okay because you know once we understand that, then we can work with it. It becomes obvious only because um, we, we get exposed to it eventually. You can't get up from the top. That's the second one. Um, Every failure is an opportunity. I've certainly failed as much as anyone, if not more. Um, I've learned that success is a process. There's never a shortage of good ideas. Um, the difference largely between success and failure is the attention to the boring logistical details um, and, and being able to understand at what point we need to perhaps change our thinking in order to move forward. And then finally, remember where you came from. In my mind, sustainable UX and sustainable design practices are not simply about how to make better apps or sites or wireframes or doing better research, although those are absolutely critical. Um, it's really about um, addressing um, our own capacity for human survival. Um, design is about our heritage. It's about legacy. It's about culture and love and faith and healing and pride. The work we do will bind families. It builds communities. It reduces social isolation, and it makes for a more inclusive society that helps everyone, no matter where they live or what they can do. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking a little time uh, today and, and, uh, and, and you know, a little time just kind of hanging out. I also want to thank um, Jen, James, and Jen from Sustainable UX to, uh, for putting this together. Um, my name is Kel Smith. Uh, my email address is kel.smith at anikto.com. That's A-N-I-K-T-O. And as a Nancy, um, it's named after the Greek word for open. And um, if you uh, want to chat about any of these things, um, you know how to find me. And in case you're interested, I did write a book about some of this stuff. It's called Digital Outcasts Moving Technology Forward Without Leaving People Behind. Um, it, it came out, it was published by Morgan Kaufman a few years ago, um, a few, I guess two, three years ago. Um, and I've been told it still holds up. Um, in any event, um, that's me. Again, thank you all for the time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.